What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Rewired Soul Podcast. And it's your host, Chris. And today I am excited and nervous uh, because, yeah, I talked to today's guest is Kurt Gray. All right. So Kurt Gray, his book is called The Mind Club. And Kurt uh, studies uh, and researches moral philosophy, and there's a lot of that in The Mind Club. And we talk a bit about The Mind Club. It's such a great book. I recently reread it. But more importantly, I was like, you know what? Why did I get into moral philosophy? Like, why did a guy like me, just random dude, get into moral philosophy? Well, some of you know a little bit of this story. Some of you know the whole story. But in 2019, I was canceled on YouTube. Uh, I had a channel that was blowing up and I was canceled. I had hundreds of thousands of strangers coming at me. Uh, There were threats, terrible things, misinformation, all that kind of stuff, right? And I didn't understand. I I didn't understand what was happening. And that's when I really started reading books. But I wanted to understand, like, how can people threaten you? How can people say the most awful, terrible things? while believing that they have the moral high ground, right? It it made no sense to me. So I got into moral philosophy. I was like, how do people see their morals, right? How do people justify that they're still a good person while doing all this terrible stuff, right? And that's when I really got into it. So today I wanted to do something a little bit different. And while we do talk about Kurt's book, and it's an awesome book, I, like I said, I just read it again for the second time. I want, I was like, how many opportunities do I have to have a moral philosopher researcher here on the podcast? So I, I tell him my story and I ask him, you know, how would a moral philosopher explain this? How would a moral philosopher explain what the hell happened to me? And I'll be honest with you, Kurt's not a therapist, but this conversation was very therapeutic for me. And if you if you are anybody who is just curious what the hell is going on, if you had the same questions that I did, like this was a great, great conversation and it's helped me understand even more. Like over the last couple of years since it happened, I've understand it, I've understood it a lot more. But this conversation, it it helped a ton. And yeah, there's also some conversation towards the end about moral philosophy and moral theory. Uh, you know, uh, there's Jonathan Haidt's work and Kurt kind of disagrees with his work and has uh, different theories and stuff. So we kind of dive into that towards the end. But but yeah, this is this was uh, one of my favorite conversations and I'm super nervous. I debated on doing <laughs> this conversation because I get flashbacks of all the stuff that went down. I'm like, oh my God, are these hate mobs going to find this and come and just attack me and say I'm playing the victim and I'm gaslighting and all the things that happen, you know? But I was like, you know what? Screw it. This episode is going to be dope. People are going to like it. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Share it if you like it. And make sure you go down to the description below. Follow Kurt over on Twitter. Get a copy of the book. I've also put a couple links uh, for uh, different websites of his and projects he's working on. So check that out down in the description below. And while you're down there, make sure you are following me as well over on Instagram and Twitter at The Rewired Soul. I'm always keeping everybody up to date with what books I'm reading, upcoming guests on the podcast. And I just enjoy talking to all of you so make sure you're following me on instagram and twitter at the rewired soul but anyways that was a super long intro but i felt like i needed to set the foundation all right but without further ado here is my conversation with kurt gray where we dive into the moral philosophy of cancel culture Hello, Kurt. How are you doing today? Good. Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we were finally able to link up. We've been chatting on Twitter for a while, so this is awesome. Um, I want you, for anybody who doesn't know you, I found out a lot of people that follow the podcast do know you, but for those who don't know you, can you introduce yourself, the kind of work you're doing and all that kind of stuff? Sure, yeah. Uh, So I'm Kurt Gray. I'm an associate professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And here I direct the Deepest Police Lab and the Center for the Science uh, for Moral Understanding. So 
together those the lab and the center work together to kind of chart out people's beliefs about morality and, mm -hmm. and religion uh, especially and to try to find ways to decrease the kind of animosity in america today mm. over moral issues yeah no I, absolutely and, and yeah we talked a little bit before this we're going to kind of dive into you know a spe specific aspect of this but I, I, my next thing i was going to ask you like when it comes to the work that you're doing I, I've been curious, like, you know, philosophy, like when you hear like, you know, I, I hear parents like saying what you want to be like a philosophy major, like what's that going to do, right? So like, but you guys are, are working on this stuff for kind of like these bigger issues, especially like with like the polarization in, you know, the United States or even in the world is, is that kind of what you guys are looking into? Like, where does your research go once you find out where people stand on different moral issues? Yeah, so we're, you know, we have this basic assumption that most disagreement, political disagreement, you know, religious disagreement is ultimately about moral disagreement mm -hmm. and moral misunderstanding, right? That the one side thinks the other side uh, is immoral and doesn't have the same morals that they do. And so once we understand these kind of like drivers that, uh, that, that, that drive us apart, we look for ways to reduce mm -hmm that animosity. So look at interventions that might bridge those divides. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. And that's, that's why I'm so excited to discuss this, because that's the whole reason I, I got excited or not even excited, like just curious about this uh, from my own experience that we'll dive into in a second. But I was just like, because it's always been interesting to me. So, you know, coming from a 12 step background, um, the, the, the fourth step, right? Like, you know, you do this like, quote, unquote, moral inventory. And like, I'm always just curious and questioning things. But something I realized is back then was like, it seems like, you know, we all have different morals, right? Like there's certain, it seems like, you know, there's certain things like, you know, well, most of us say it's morally wrong to like kill somebody, right? But just for example, like some people are into like polyamory, some people are straight monogamous. I'm a vegetarian, a lot of people aren't. So I kind of understood that we kind of look at things morally different. Do you think that that is just something that a lot of people don't really understand or is it hard to grasp because that's kind of why I got into this like we don't understand that someone's morals might just be a little bit different from us based on how they were raised or you know other circumstances in their lives yeah it's a great question I think I think people appreciate that other people have different morals but they often don't appreciate that you can have different morals and still be moral at your heart mm -hmm. right like it just because right so i'm not a vegetarian mm -hmm. and I, i'd like to think that even though that's a moral stance you hold like you don't think that i'm hitler basically right <laughs> yeah just, yeah exactly just for, you know eating bacon uh sometimes so it, it, it's hard to kind of reconcile the sense that someone's a moral person while also having different moral positions mm -hmm. yeah and and that 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 also brings me to your book, The Mind Club. That's how I was introduced to you. And, uh, you know, you dive into that, like, uh, like just the moral questions around, you know, animals, like why, you know, why are we totally fine with all these cows getting slaughtered? But hey, if you abuse a dog or a cat, you will go viral and people will hunt you down and just like all these types of things. So in the mind, in the mind club, like such a great book, like, can you just kind of talk a little bit about how our perception of mind and and there's ways way too much for us to even get into but can you talk a little bit about how we perceive the mind and how that kind of uh you know shapes our moral understandings or how we view morality because it, it seems like that's the main core of the book but correct me if i'm wrong yeah yeah that's absolutely right and there's a there's a kind of fundamental problem or issue that underlies the mind club and that is the problem of other minds right mm -hmm. so we're having this conversation uh it seems that you're like a thinking you know person who has emotions but like i don't know are you a super sophisticated ai bot we've never met you know yeah, yeah. In time it's the pandemic like you you know you could be uh, a, a computer somewhere for all i know mm -hmm. and so that happens on a on a kind of like philosophical fun thought experiment scale, but also on a kind of fundamentally human scale every day when we interact with people and we think, are, are you really a kind of person the same way I'm a person? Like, do you have as deep a thoughts 
and, mm-hmm. and as much compassion as empathy as I think I do. And if, if I don't think you do, then perhaps like, you, you know, you don't deserve the kind of moral concern that I do, mm-hmm. right? Maybe, maybe we should go to war. Maybe I shouldn't be friends with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that exists between people, right? As we dehumanize, uh, you know, people who are different than ourselves, but it also happens in an even stronger sense with things that aren't human or entities that aren't human, right? Like animals, mm-hmm. like you, you might have a pet and you think, you know, my dog, wow, like she can feel embarrassment and like schadenfreude and all yeah, nostalgia, yeah. you know, rich emotions you like wouldn't even attribute to like, you know, uh, another person sometimes. Mm-hmm. But I might look at your dog and just be like, you know, it's just a fur ball that, that sometimes yeah. poops on your rug, you know? Yeah. So th- there's a huge difference here with animals, with, with gods, you know, like you might think that God loves you and, and has like a rich sense of concern for, for you and your family. And someone else might not even believe that there's a God. So, you know, and those are all kinds of minds. um, And and we have different perceptions of those minds because it's hard to get at the reality of of those minds. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, one of the things we'll dive into in just a minute here is just, I think one of the things I found interesting is just how our morals just kind of shit. Like, I think, I think we, uh, we have this idea that, you know, we have a moral compass and that compass is just, it's pointing in a direction and that's the way we always are. But like in the book, even like early on in the book, like you talk about a serial killer, right? And, but like, he was so concerned about the well-being of his dog, you know? Like some people value like the lives of animals more than people and things like that. Like I, I've met people like, so by the way, like my, my vegetarianism, it started for like just purely health reasons, but it just got me thinking about the moral aspect of it. But uh, anyways, like I've seen like these, you know, I've seen hardcore vegans, vegetarians that are just like, you know, I think you brought this up in the book, like PETA argues that, you know, hey, maybe we should like kill the scientists who test on animals, you know, <laughs> things like that. So yeah. it's, yeah. it's, it's really interesting. But, but, you know, one thing that I, I wanted to ask you is like, none of us, none of us think we're a bad person, though. Like we're all there's that saying, we're all the heroes of our own story. Is that anything that you've like researched, looked into? Because that seems to be like, nobody's like, oh, yeah, I'm just a morally terrible person. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think everyone, as you say, thinks that they are a hero. We've actually got some research on this uh, ongoing. Mm. Like, you know, if you ask people to kind of identify with different moral roles, like heroes and villains, victims, everyone says, look, I'm a hero, right? E- even if they've done bad things. Um, mm-hmm. There's a, a little variation. So sometimes people think that they are maybe a little bit of a villain. You got to do bad things to get stuff done. But mm-hmm. even super villains, right? They're like, I gonna burn down the world to make it better yeah like you know? thanos right that, like when i when i was watching the avengers it's like he was like i'm saving you know the universe or galaxy by sapping my fingers and getting rid of half the people it was for like population control right he thought he was being a hero right and like architects of of genocide and eugenics mm. you know like they, they they think they're doing the right thing and that's kind of helped by mind perception because if you just say well this group of people, they don't have a, have a mind. They're basically mm. like livestock. Then you can, you can kind of sleep at night better thinking that you're destroying people that don't have minds. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild. And I need to, I need to jump into this story because I will, I want to pick your brain all day long about this stuff. And I keep wanting to ask you other things, but the main, the main reason I want to talk to you is kind of, uh, I, the moral philosophy around cancel culture. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. Okay, Kurt, I'm going to try to limit it because I wrote an entire book on my experience, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to shorten it to just a few minutes. All right. Right. So I, I, I got into moral, uh, moral philosophy just because I wanted to understand what happened. So, you know, just a uh, summarized version of this. I'm a recovering drug addict. I got sober in 2012, almost died. Couldn't talk to my son, see my son, anything. Took a lot of work, got clean, got sober and realized how important mental health was. Eventually I ended up working at a rehab and this was like a luxury rehab. Like I think, you know, cash payment was like 30 grand for a month. Uh, High end insurance covered it, all that stuff. But uh, when I was doing groups, for people, I was a, an alumni coordinator, so kind of like peer support, you know, I'd share my story and help other people and stuff like that. And 
you know, uh, I would see kind of this lack of gratitude, right? And I'm just like, do you know how many people, because I got sober, I didn't have any insurance or anything. I got sober with no treatment, nothing. I just had to go to like free 12 step meetings and hopefully survive like I was dying. So when I saw people being ungrateful, I'm like, you know what? There's so many people out there who wish they could be in this treatment center. And then I got the idea. I'm like, well, why don't I just like do some of the groups that I do in treatment, but like I do it on YouTube. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm like, okay, this will be free. This is a nice moral thing that I'm doing. Right. Cause 12 step programs teach you to be of service to other people and all that kind of stuff. So I started doing it on there, but I'm, we're going to talk about utilitarianism in a minute. Right. <laughs> but I, I looked at it and YouTube has all these algorithmic issues. Like if you talk about depression, suicide, addiction, they're like, ah, that's kind of touchy for advertisers. We're not going to put it out there as much. But the goal I have is to help as many people as possible. So I figured out this hack, right? I, I noticed that there was a lot of stuff like, uh, you know, tabloid media, like when you're at the grocery store and just all the stuff we see about celebrities, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a whole community of YouTube, what they call drama channels and commentary channels. And I would sit back and watch and we kind of, I noticed that we kind of glorify people uh, who are, uh, for lack of better words, setting a bad example. But, you know, I have a lot of empathy. A lot of people, you know, they either haven't gotten treatment yet or they don't know, you know, or whatever. But I was looking at this and I saw that millions of people are watching this. I'm like, well, that's not really helping anybody. I'm like, what if we took this and we see what we can learn from it, right? So if, if one of these famous YouTubers that everybody's talking about, you know, whatever, I would jump in and I'd make a video saying, hey, like I can relate to this, this, this breakup going on. I used to be in toxic relationships, you know what I mean? And I felt kind of morally on the fence about it, right? Like, is it okay to talk about this person's life in order to help others? See, this is where this kind of utilitarian idea comes in, right? Uh -huh. I'm talking about this one person in order to help the audience. And, you know, the way I, I kind of rationalized it was, well, they're, they're having these mental breakdowns and not getting therapy or not addressing them and influencing all these people, right? So I think it's a greater good if I hop in here and say, hey, if you're struggling with this in your life, maybe you should go get help, right? And that's kind of what I did. My channel blows up. My YouTube channel blows up. I was taking pop culture and using it to teach people about how to take care of their mental health. I was like, oh man, look at this. I'm just, you know, being all altruistic while also being able to pay my bills. This is dope. Okay. Uh -huh. So, so that's, that's kind of where it started. And I think I kind of want to pause there. All right. So I, I think you'll do a better job explaining this than I am because I, when I got into this, this is where I found, I, I learned about utilitarianism and deontology and I was like, oh, like that's kind of me, like this utilitarian idea. And, you know, like the trolley problem, I'll kill that one person every single time. Right. Um, right. So, so I don't, I don't know. Is that, is, is that like a bad way of thinking? Because when I think of like, you know, Kant's views and deontology, it seems impossible. I, I can't imagine anybody being like nope it's all good all the time never any sacrifices right so and I guess my first question is am I morally messed up in my head for that kind of view <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a, a priest here giving absolution yeah uh, what's moral philosophy say about kind of this this first part of my story <laughs> you know right like, it'd be funny if I could just be like, no, you're a terrible person, end of interview. Um, right, <laughs> just leave. <laughs> I'm not talking anymore. Um, well, you know, the thing about these competing moral concerns is that you can be both moral and immoral at the same time, depending on your perspective. So, right, like, if you ask people, is it is it okay to exploit someone else's life? Mm -hmm. You know, they'll just say, well, no. Right, like that's the deontological thing, right? It, the act itself is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then if you ask people, well, is it okay to help hundreds of people? They'll say, well, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, and now you put the two together, is it okay to exploit someone's <laughs> life to help hundreds of people? <laughs> Ugh, you know? Yeah. Like, may, maybe, you know, maybe it, it, does it depend on how many people you help, how much you exploit them? Does a celebrity actually put themselves out there? 
in their kind of like public domain now. It, mm -hmm. The questions uh, keep coming and answers aren't easy. So, you know, me personally, I, you know, I'm more of a utilitarian as well. I think nice, uh, <laughs> right? That 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 it's okay to to bear some cost uh, to help many, but you know, it's not easy. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not easy to make that decision. So, uh, but I'm happy to offer you moral absolution. <laughs> Thank you. And, and uh, we have Kurt Gray on record giving me moral absolution. <laughs> but, but yeah, kind of like, uh, you know, with, with what you're saying, right? Like we, we look at this and I, you know, I, I like to think of myself as somebody who has overcome a lot of my impulsivity issues since getting sober and stuff. And I put a lot of thought into like big decisions like, like this one and making this content. And kind of like you mentioned, the way I looked at it was, this is already public information. It's already out there, right? It's not as if I was spying on people or pretending to be their friend to get this information. I was only doing it on public information. But I, I feel like, you know, uh, the next part of this is in the book, in the mind club, you have this kind of thought experiment. <laughs> and this is why I love moral philosophers. You have this thought experiment of like a CEO punching a baby. All right. <laughs> Um, and then, and then you switch it. Like, is it okay for a CEO to hit a baby? And it's like, no, is it okay? But if a baby hit a CEO, we would laugh. So now I kind of want to talk about like our moral views on power dynamics. Cause that's kind of what I got from that thought experiment. So the other thing I would try to do is, you know, uh, in YouTube, the, the power dynamic is really uh, kind of, you know, a smaller channel and then a bigger channel, right? Like I had tens of thousands of subscribers. If I'm talking about somebody with hundreds of thousands or millions, that's me kind of punching up. So based on the CEO baby punching, I'm the baby punching the CEO, right? And for a while, I want to circle back because for a long time, this was totally okay. And everybody found it morally all right. But can you kind of discuss that? Like why, why we see it okay to kind of punch up, but not punch down and does that ever does that ever switch where even punching up is not seen as okay that's something i was having a hard time grasping yeah great question so my work suggests that when we look at the moral world right it's complicated it's messy there's different values there's different philosophies you can kind of cut through a lot of that by understanding that when we when we see acts and we want to know if they're immoral we apply this kind of template. Mm -hmm. and, and that template is exactly basically, as you said, is someone punching down, uh, right? Is, is someone who is capable of intention and agency and action, you know, hurting someone who's relatively more vulnerable, right? That's mm -hmm. why the CEO and the baby seem so wrong. Um, and the flip, right? If someone who's like a vulnerable person who is somehow uh, hurting someone who's like intentional and thoughtful and, and powerful and less vulnerable, it, it doesn't seem as bad. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of like look at this, uh, use this template to kind of like match up to the moral world, right? Like mm -hmm. imagine you have this like picture of a CEO punching a baby and you just like hold it up next to whatever you're, you're trying to judge. And you're like, oh yeah, if that, if that looks the same, then that's bad. So child abuse is bad, right? Elder abuse is bad. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, if a if a big man beats his, you know, kind of like smaller wife, that's terrible. But then you've got something like now imagine that that this, you know, uh, uh, there's a real tough guy, you know, like Vin Diesel. And yeah. it turns out that he's getting abused by his wife, who's like five foot two mm. you know, and, and weighs 90 pounds soaking wet. Well, mm -hmm. now, we, you know, we're like, I don't believe you. Right. And, and even if it was happening, like, surely that's not a big deal. Um, and, and so our moral judgments kind of make sense of the world in, in a way that, you know, aligned with a lot of our laws and our intuitions, but sometimes that can lead us astray. Um, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it comes down to who you think is more vulnerable, right? Mm. So, you know, you come at this and saying like, look, I don't have as many followers. I'm just trying to educate the people who need it by using a celebrity. Mm -hmm. but you ask a celebrity and you're like, Look, yeah. I just have these followers because I did some movie, 
right? Like I'm just trying to make a living. I'm just trying to do some art. And like all these people are piling on me, like I'm the victim here, yeah. right? So your perceptions don't necessarily match the celebrities. Yeah, and and that that brings me to one of the the studies you did. And so I would really love if you could explain this study, but uh, it was giving someone like Mother Teresa a pill that causes pain. Do you remember that one that you yeah, discussed? Yeah. Okay, because when I read that in your book, like, because I, I first read your book, God, what was it like last year or whatever? And I think the first time I came across this study, because as you know, I, I just recently reread the book. But when I first came across, I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, this kind of makes sense, right? So uh, let's do this. Can you kind of explain the study and then I'll go from there with how I kind of related to it, even though, by the way, I am not calling myself Mother Teresa, but can you kind of explain what that study was, what you were looking for and kind of what you found? Yeah, yeah. We'll start with like the, the obvious version, right? So imagine that you've got some pills and those pills um, cause a little bit of, uh, of pleasure, okay? Like they make mm -hmm. people feel nice. Um, and you could give them to uh, an orphan who suffered, uh, Hitler or Mother Teresa, <laughs> right? Yeah. So no one gives the pleasure pills to Hitler because mm -hmm. you know, that's that guy. Um, and then you're like, do, do, does Mother Teresa need them? Probably not, you know, like she, you know, she is happy just doing God's work. Mm -hmm. And so let's give them to the orphan who's had a tough life, mm -hmm. okay? Um, now imagine you've got some pills that cause pain and you have to give them to someone, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and we're going to take Hitler out of the mix because everyone gives them to Hitler, right? Like, do you give yeah. it to the orphan or do you give it to mother Teresa? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you give it to mother Teresa, right? Because like she can take it. She's tough. Now let's change it a little bit and say, you've got mother Teresa and just an average person, right? Like a mm -hmm. bank teller. Well, mm -hmm. it turns out people are still more likely if they're forced to choose to give it to Mother Teresa. And you're mm -hmm. like, well, I guess that makes sense because she devotes her life to helping others. And so when push comes to shove, maybe she'd be willing to take it. Yeah. But, but that's an assumption, right? Like basically what you're saying is like, this person's done a lot of good in the world. And so if someone has to suffer, it should be them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's messed up, right? Like that, you devote it, your life to helping it, others. And then when push comes to shove, people are like, let's stick you with pain, right? Like that, that violates every assumption about karma, right? About <laughs> yeah, justice, yeah. Right? Like, uh, yeah, you're a good person. Screw you, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so Kurt, as you're, as you're explaining this, can you kind of see why I found this study so interesting? Uh, based on, you know, why I started my channel and what I was trying to do. Like, that's, like, when I saw it, because I, I started it, you know, when, when anybody asked, like, I was like, because there's a lot of people who can't, who don't have the money or the resource, uh, resources or the healthcare to go to treatment, I want to help people. And because of the YouTube algorithms, I found a, a way to reach more people was by doing this. But also, and maybe this is, you know, more of a question uh, for a therapist, which I have discussed with her, but like, is, do you, do you think that this had something to do with kind of, cause yeah, I, I didn't even really give the numbers, but I had hundreds of thousands of complete strangers just dogpiling on me. Right. And when I read this, I'm like, were people looking at me as like, okay, this is a guy who got sober. He beat drug addiction. He was dying. He got his son back. He got his life back. Shit's going good for him, right? And my channel was on the upswing. So even though I didn't have the money or the power or whatever, was it possible that I was perceived as someone who could take it? Right? And I, I don't know, with all the anger and animosity just in the world, I'm curious is, is that something that might have been going on, a factor in it? I think that's right. So one thing is that now, you know, you've proven your, your agency, your power, right? Your self-control, your intention. But the, the, the really interesting thing about this way we view the moral world, right? As kind of like agents who do and, and the vulnerable who receive mm -hmm. is that the line between a hero and a villain is really fine. What do you right? mean by that? They're both doers, mm. right? So when you perceive someone, it's really easy once they're a, a hero 
to kind of flip them into villain mm. because it's the same kind of mind, the kind of active, doing, thoughtful mind, right? Like an evil villain is like, I'm going to think hard about this and then do it. And a hero is like, I'm going to think hard about this and do it, right? They both <laughs> yeah. So, you know, many people may see you as a hero. You overcame these challenges, right? You're, you're powerful now. You've got a lot of influencers. But, you know, the other people could see you now as a villain, right? Like you've risen up you've got your power back right and now Mm. what you're doing is like beating down these celebrities to make you more money and more influence you know Mm -hmm. when you frame the narrative that way like you're not a hero anymore like you're the villain yeah so does i'm curious so is the perception of the you know quote unquote victim is that they're just kind of being while the other person is doing like for example if somebody is turning on their camera and you know talking about this extremely toxic relationship or you know uh having a breakdown or just anything else right like is that just them are they perceived as just being them whereas you know the act of me making comments about it and trying to relate it to people that's more of doing like one seems passive and one seems active does that make sense yeah Exactly, right? Like someone's just, they're being vulnerable and that's a key, right? Opening yourself up, vulnerability. Like that's what we think about when we think of like victims and people who are these on the receiving end of good and evil. And, and you're taking that vulnerability and you're, you're using it, right? You're applying your, your thoughts and your intentions uh, and your understanding, right? Your agency. So um, that's exactly right, right? They're the victim here. And, and you know, you could be a hero in some sense to all the other people you're helping, but mm-hmm. in that one kind of pairing of dyad between you and the celebrity, in some sense, you're the villain to, to them, even if you're the, uh, the hero to everyone else. And, and that goes back to, to utilitarianism, right? Mm. Like you're the villain to one person. It's a yeah, bad you pull, act that, you pull that trolley yeah. lover. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but you're helping all these other people, right? So you know, you've chosen to flip the switch in the trolley problem, uh, at, at least in the minds of other people who are perceiving you. Yeah. And something, I, you know, the other thing is that I was, that I thought a lot about too, is, you know, uh, in, in the book, you talk a lot about, you know, just uh, when you're part of a group and the kind of anonymity you have, and you talk about just accountability and being online and all these other kind of things, right? So I'm, I, I don't know if this is more of a, uh, a thing with like anonymity or if it's self-deception. So I got really into like, kind of like the psychology and evolutionary psychology behind self-deception, right? So as you're discussing, it's like when we're, when we're helping one area, we're often screwing up something else. Um, I, I would guess that you watched The Good Place, right? Did you? Yeah, I've seen, I, 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 <laughs> Watch the first season. And okay. I <laughs> so I got a couple of kids. It's hard to muster. Yeah, I, I hear you. And, well, eventually, if you get back to watching it, eventually they talk about unintended consequences, right? Doing something good and something you didn't even think of going bad. And, you know, I think if we all zoomed in on ourselves, we could think of, a, you know, many of these instances where we did something and maybe it caused harm in, in another place. But anyways, so when I'm thinking about self-deception, why, why do you think... It, it's it's so easy for people to morally judge others while deceiving themselves that they're on this like kind of moral high ground because it felt when I see like it, it, anywhere in cancel culture, online outrage culture, it seems as though the person, people in the group doing the dogpiling, they are acting as though they are just the pillar of morality. And none of us are like is there anything that you've looked into like when it comes to this kind of lie that we tell ourselves like about how morally great we are so there's a couple things one is that when it's online there's already social consensus that's you know someone's uh, evil right so it's easy to kind of pile on it, mm-hmm. it's easy to kind of be a a follower in the crowd but the i think the fundamental thing is an asymmetry right you understand your own intentions, right? Again, this is the problem mm. of other minds, yeah. right? Like, you know, you have the best intentions. Like when you act, you meant to do well, but when you see other people, all you see is their actions, right? You don't mm. know what their intentions are. So 
if someone's judging you, you're like, look, I, I wanted to help people. I got clean. I wanted to help other people get clean, especially those who couldn't afford it, right? Like that's a mm. heroic thing. Mm -hmm. But they look at your acts, right? Like just the act. And it's like, this guy's making YouTube videos shitting on celebrities who are already in pain or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you can see that th that's clearly different, right? Like the intention and perhaps one interpretation of the act. And yeah. So I think, again, the problem of other minds really really gets in the way yeah it's yeah it, it's it's really interesting because you know i got really into just biases and r rationality and there's uh you know the attribution bias right where we give ourselves like you know we're like oh well here's why i did it you know we have all these reasons and everything but we see somebody else's action and we assume the worst like if somebody and like if i'm speeding and cut somebody off it's like well i'm in a hurry and if i'm late to work i'm gonna get written up or fired but if somebody else speeds and cuts us off like they're just a dick you know so it it oh. kind of it kind of seems like seems like that and and i i guess my next question for you about this whole situation you may have already touched on when we were talking about that that fine line between hero and villain um so part of my experience and and i wish i would have started with this for anybody who's been listening it's like oh this this jerk chris just taking <laughs> just talking about poor celebrities <laughs> but uh i I'm curious about how we find something morally okay until it's not. Like that's just something that was playing on a loop in my head. Like I went from, just to give you kind of an idea, like some people are on YouTube for years and it'll take them years to get thousands or even a hundred thousand subscribers. I did this in the matter of a year and I was constantly getting emails and messages. Chris, thank you. Thank you. Just, I can relate to that experience too. And you helped me go to therapy. You helped me go to treatment. and. It was just morally okay. This thing was on a wide scale, morally okay, what I was doing. And then once some people started questioning it, boom, it became morally not okay. And like part of the, you know, part of the thing that I had a hard time like dealing with and grasping was like, I had people who just weeks prior uh, before this started telling me, thank you for saving my life, right? And then the next few weeks later, hating me and thinking I'm just, the worst person, even though nothing with me changed or anything I was doing changed. Does that make sense? Like, like how, how we kind of switch, like something goes from morally okay to not okay, just like that. Well, a <coughs> lot of it, yeah, is, is kind of just like what the social consensus is, right? Mm -hmm. And, and there's so many layers. So even if you all look, you know, everyone agrees on like exactly what you're doing, that can still change, right? So, you know, there's changing norms about jokes and when it comes to mm. racism and sexism and um, homophobia, right? Yeah. So, so there's norms of acceptability, uh, how you treat animals, for instance, another one. But, but then added to that, you can also change your understanding of the act, right? So again, it's easy to shift from Chris is trying to help others to Chris is exploiting people who are at mm. their rock bottom. And, you know, one thing I often think about is uh, nature documentaries. That seems okay. a little uh, far afield, but like, <laughs> you know, you're like focusing on one animal, right? Let's say it's like a, <clears throat> it's a fox. And you're like, yeah. oh, I'm like really concerned about the fox. <laughs> like the fox is trying to feed its babies and the fox like leaps on this mouse and, you know, or this hen and kills it and it's bloody. But like, thank goodness the fox can feed its babies. But then if you were watching a documentary about the mouse, right? You're like, the mouse is just trying to, you know, get by and feed its babies and then it gets eaten by a fox. Like that's brutal, right? So we can shift who the protagonist is and who the victim is when we perceive the world. Um, in nature documentaries and also in our moral world, right? Mm -hmm. So you were the hero helping these people and now we can shift the frame and now the celebrity is the victim and you're the villain. So these things can shift depending on who our focus is on and that's determined by our kind of social uh, consensus and, and what people are doing. So here's, here's where I'm curious, like, uh, you know, when, like when you talk about like, you know, the work you do and kind of like the, the bigger goal, right, of, of this work, like how in the hell can any of us on an individual level deal with that, right? Where, 
we because you know we're a social species and we look to others for social norms and what's acceptable so if for example you know i'll use myself as an example if i'm looking to others and they're saying this is morally acceptable and then one day it's not like how how is how are any of us supposed to deal with this and you you mentioned like uh you know jokes that used to be okay and then they're not okay you know based on how times change and all that kind of stuff and you know, like, uh, like I'm half black and I would, I would, uh, I would quickly think that someone say, well, what about slavery? You know, that was morally okay. Then was, you know what I mean? But I'm like, I'm like, okay, but we're not talking about something as morally intense, you know? So for these more like social issues, like jokes and things like that, because that's a lot of what we see with outrage culture, cancel culture and things like that. Like how, how, like, have, has your lab or your research like found anything for like solutions that we could do on an individual level when we're constantly looking to others for what's acceptable? Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's tough. So one thing that you can do is you can use norms to kind of shape the acceptability of things, right? You can make things okay. Um, you can reveal that in, in fact, they're not harmful or they're causing other harms, right? So this is what cancel culture has, uh, opponents of cancel culture have tried to do, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're silencing important voices here and that's gonna ultimately cause harm. So you can battle claims of harm with other claims of harm. And I think that that's really the only way to do it, right? Like you think this is harmful, well, suppressing these voices, that's also harmful. But mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know, look, moral change is messy, right? And, mm. and it's the same process, whether it's small or big, because small things combine to, to big things, right? So when we did have slavery, those, you know, how that changed was through a lot of kind of changes in mindset, and then eventually mm. through obviously legislation and civil war, et cetera. Um, but like, you wouldn't want to stop moral change totally, right? Like now there's there's gay rights a lot more yeah. than there was. And I think that's that's great, right? And people can smoke weed if they want to instead of going to jail for it. Like, that's great. Um, and, and so I don't, I don't know if the bad outweighs the good, but I think moral change is generally good. You know, the expansion of the moral circle uh, to include mm -hmm. more people, that's yeah. great. But I think it's not costless all the time. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's it's really interesting, and I think you know that that's one of the that's one of the strange things. Like I often feel, uh, I, I had Megan Dom on here a while ago, and we were talking, and she was she was talking about uh, you know uh, people like liberals who feel like kind of like politically homeless, right? Like I'm you know I'm super progressive, right? I'm pretty damn progressive and everything like that. But, and typically, when you see this kind of cancel culture, outrage culture, it's coming from the left but like i i can see you know harm being done to you know uh minorities the lgbtq community and all these things so i'm all about this kind of like hey we need to talk about this and moral change like you like you mentioned like uh you know uh moral changes in like gay gay rights and you know being being able to get married and so many things like i see the benefits of that but it's difficult being in the middle because i see where it goes way 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 too far and that that brings me to something you know that i i don't know if if you've looked into this yet but uh i don't know any other word for it than like this kind of moral justification and here's what i mean by that kurt so you look at the harm or perception of harm that i'm causing right a person mm -hmm. uh, uh a celebrity you know whatever and you know uh because that's kind of what happened um that kind of led to this like you know i was a nobody and then eventually like some of the people i had videos about they saw them right mm -hmm. so that was part of it as well so they they're like you know i don't like this right that's what they said i don't like this that was the extent of the harm you know what i mean like we have stories in the news popping up of somebody saying something and someone like killing themselves or whatever right i never had any of that happen it was just somebody saying i don't like this this hurt my feelings so if i'm if i'm looking at a harm scale of like one to ten i find that pretty low like ten being like death right <laughs> <laughs> one being my feelings right so i'm like okay that's pretty low on the scale i hurt their feelings but anyways and i'm sure you've seen this with outrage culture cancel culture when things blew up with me people were 
uh, saying that they wish I would die, that they wish I would relapse, that they would, you know, um, my, uh, I, I'm not a, yeah, I'm not a good father. Oh, it gets better, Kurt, that I'm not a good father. My son should be taken away from me. What's worse is they, they go and start uh, tracking down my mom and her information. People are threatening to rape and kill my mom, right? My girlfriend's getting messages. So, so again, right? Like if I look at, you know, even, even if like you had the argument, okay, Chris, what you're doing is not morally okay. The harm on that one to 10 scale seem very low, but how do people justify like saying, okay, you did this little harm. It's morally okay for me to want this much harm on you. Right? Like, for example, like uh, when this happened, like it was a struggle for me to stay sober, right? I, I had like eh, six, seven years, you know, but I had to stay sober through that. You know, I struggle with depression, all these other things. And I would just think about that. I'm like, why do you guys think this is morally okay? Because they're coming from a moral place. So I, I don't know, like, help me, help me understand this, Kurt. Yeah, I mean, you know, righteousness can blind you, right, to the suffering of others. So that I've got some work on something called moral typecasting and yeah. you know and the example is like whatever Leonard Nimoy is Spock you know he's like typecast or Vin Diesel is up you know he, he's always like the fast car driving uh action hero yeah and we, we cast others into moral roles too right and so once you're seen as a villain or a hero but really a villain especially mm -hmm. people have a hard time even imagining that the villain is vulnerable Right, like no one's like, oh, poor Thanos, whatever, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Or like Hitler, you know, like Osama bin Laden. Like, let's think about how Osama bin Laden gets sad when someone says, you know, mean things to him, right? Like, pe people, yeah. Americans especially, be like, you're insane. Like, you shouldn't even think of someone who's an evil terrorist as having feelings. But like, guess what? Everyone has feelings, right? And yeah. so, once you're in that villain role and people are piling on, right? Like we we feel justified because there's social consensus and feel, we feel justified because you're seen to totally lack vulnerability. So mm -hmm. in, in a scale of harm, you know, it's a subjective scale, right? So a celebrity who's, who, you know, who's at their lowest point and you're saying bad things about them, they'll be like, that's a seven out of 10 on a harm scale. So they but perceive see, it as higher. That's right. Got and they'll it. see you who's like exploiting this poor celebrity and otherwise like evil as like actually just a two, you know, like they're just saying some shit mm. about you on Twitter or on YouTube. It's like not a big deal, right? So in their mind, they're causing less harm than you are. But, you know, I think we could agree there's an objective thing, right? Like threatening your mom versus, yeah. you know, a celebrity saying like, I'm not really sure I like this. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, their moral perceptions and perceptions, yeah. you know, uh, are funny things. Yeah, yeah. Aside from moral philosophy, the other uh, topic I dove really into to try to understand all this was uh, just crowd psychology, right? Because it blows my mind that like, it's so difficult for, you know, a few people to step back and say, wait, this is kind of messed up. And this is completely irrational, right? Like, we're perceiving this as a seven, is it really a seven? But that's kind of, you know, what, what, outrage culture is like wouldn't you say like when when you look like as as somebody who researches this stuff like is this something that you've noticed like just is is it just people's i don't know meter like is it their their moral meter is it completely out of whack like what what is this thing where people are perceiving small acts of harm as these massive catastrophes uh i don't know if you read uh you know the coddling of the american mind but they talk about it in that too like the uh catastrophizing this cognitive distortion right like is this something that you've seen kind of change like even since you were you know younger i think we're close into age but like how 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 has this been affecting the kind of culture of what we're seeing today yeah i I guess I'll say a, a couple things. One is that I think this this story is as old as humankind. Mm. It's easy to say it's worse these days, and I think it probably is because of social media. You know, there can be more piling on. There can be more, um, you know, crowd behavior. But you know, there's always been power in symbolic actions, and there's always been the perception of a slippery slope. So, mm. you know, the scarlet letters, you know, there's a bit of adultery and 
you have to basically brand someone with a scarlet letter because you think that if you don't, it's going to spread, right? And everyone's going to be yeah. doing adultery or like a witch, right? Like there's a there's a woman with mental illness and she lives in your village and she's a little kooky. Holy shit, it's Satan going to destroy the world, you know? Yeah. So I, I yeah, I think people have always taken small counter normative or immoral things as being evidence of like large scale moral decay and mm -hmm. they've blown it up um to to kind of like huge proportions and the interesting thing is on one hand right like cancel culture they see huge harms and things that are uh, are relatively harmless mm -hmm. right but i think also those like um you know john height also see a lot of harms and things that are are also not that harmful like everyone does it on all sides right mm -hmm. so looks you know someone saying look you were an asshole for saying that and like you should apologize mm -hmm. right for saying this thing well maybe you were kind of an asshole for saying that and maybe you you should apologize and just because people get upset about you know saying unkind things doesn't mean that all of american youth will be destroyed you know yeah yeah um, that's so crazy I, I just think right that there's ways to blow up the harms in both ways and and they're competing narratives um, mm -hmm. and i think the truth is always somewhere in the middle yeah and you know what's crazy kurt let me tell you let me tell you what's crazy about this so as you're talking right so like when we're talking about like the scarlet letter or like the wish trials or whatever there's this fear that it's going to spread right so going back to the origin of my situation, I took a very utilitarian stance, right? One person to help the masses. And what's nuts is these people took the exact same ideology, right? Like we need to destroy and deplatform this guy in order to make sure this doesn't spread. It's All kind right. of the same philosophical outlook, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? This is like, this is how the moral mind works right? Like you think you're the victim. They think they're the victim and, you know, and, and who's to say who's right, right? When everyone's doing the same thing. Yeah. How, okay. Here's a, here's a random side question. How do you keep your sanity working on this stuff every day? Like we've been talking for about 40 minutes and I'm like, people are ridiculous. And you look at this every single day. Like, do you have to just come in with curiosity to work every single day and just no judgment? Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, as we're talking, I'm like, is there any hope for us to just chill out and have decent conversations and stuff like that? How do you, how do you, how do you keep your mind intact? <laughs> I mean, I think it is, it is possible to have, have decent conversations if, uh, if you kind of check the outrage. And I think it, it's, that's really hard in, in America today, right? With the kind of outrage culture on social media. But, but look, you know, I, I'm pretty progressive. I'm Canadian, you know, mm -hmm. I'm an academic. Um, I talk uh, a lot to kind of my, my progressive uh, colleagues, but I also get, I get funding from, from folks who are pretty conservative, right? Um, mm -hmm. The center that I run is funded by the Charles Koch Foundation. Um, and when I talk to my liberal colleagues and when I talk to, to conservative donors, right, I'm always struck by the fact that everyone is morally earnest and everyone wants what's best for their kids, right? Mm -hmm. This is when, yeah. you know, liberals are talking like, this person said this thing and the world's going to end. And when conservatives are saying cancel culture is going to destroy America, right? Like everyone's worried about America being <laughs> destroyed. Yeah. But, but everyone's yeah. trying to do their best. So I, I think if you, again, with the problem of other minds, keep in mind that everyone has good intentions Mm -hmm. and they're doing inevitably what the moral mind is kind of programmed to do you can kind of see that you know <laughs> that everyone has the has a good heart um, and of course there's some who don't but but most people are trying to do the best uh, and so that's what keeps me sane yeah yeah it, it it's it's nuts too man like i like i recently like i i just i just turned 36 and i got into moral philosophy like a year or two ago but i i truly feel like it is just one of the most important topics, right? Like I have, I have, you know, authors come on here and we talk about, you know, science denial and conspiracy theories. And, you know, we've seen like the capital insurrection, you see the, the voter fraud conspiracy, just so many things, so much turmoil and everything. And it seems like if we can get down and just kind of understand like kind of what you were just talking about, like 
everybody has good intentions. Everybody has, you know, kids that they care about or families that they care about or, you know, whatever. And, and it's, it's just interesting, um, you know, in the book, in the mind club, you, you dive into like dehumanization and all sorts of things. And it just feels like we're unable to connect. And I, I, I didn't know if I wanted to dive into this because I, I, I heard you have this conversation, a similar conversation on another podcast. Uh, what was it? Idea sleep furiously. You talked a bit about like Jonathan Heights theories and everything like that. So let's hop into that. And can you tell me where you agree, disagree and everything? Because the first book I read on moral philosophy was uh, The Righteous Mind. Mm-hmm. And when uh, John lays out his kind of uh, moral foundations theory and the taste buds and talked about conservatives versus liberals, that I, I feel like that was like one of my biggest aha moments. I'm like, holy, like, this makes sense, right? Like conservatives, they care more about certain things, like, you know, whether it's loyalty or, you know, whatever. And when I was able to view the world in that lens, I feel like I've been a little bit more empathetic. I've been able to cut people some slack. I've been able to understand, you know, like, hey, maybe their upbringing, they were taught that this is more important than this, right? Like, for example, like liberals and progressives were like, oh, save the world, save everybody. And conservatives are like America, you know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. But I feel like the moral foundations theory helped me understand that. So um, I don't know if it'll be helpful for you to break it down for the listeners who don't know what the moral foundations theory is, but can you kind of discuss it where you agree, where you disagree? And, you know, like if if there's an, an alternative, I'm all ears, because like I said, I feel like it really help me view the world differently. Sure, yeah. So the um, first I wanna say, right, I think John did a service to, to the field um, for really focusing on liberal and conservative differences and, and helping to explain in some sense conservatives to progressives, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, he, and he's an amazing writer and amazing thinker. The, the idea of moral foundations theory, kind of as you say, uh, as, as John argues, is that there's a set of moral taste buds. Uh, conservatives have five of them that are active. So harm and fairness, uh, purity, or right? that's concerned about like bo- bodily sanctity and religion, uh, mm-hmm. authority and, and loyalty. And liberals just have two, which is concerns about harm and, and fairness. Um, I think there are a number of problems with this theory. Um, and, and I think the main problem is, is what's true about the theory isn't anything new, and what's new about the theory isn't true. So explain. Yeah. That. yeah. Right? So what's, <laughs> right. What's true about the theory is that liberals and conservatives differ a little bit uh, on the, the values that they focus on that's almost inherent in the definition of conservatives and and liberals, right? And progressives. Mm -hmm. Conservatives are more focused on traditional values, right? On on kind of like uniformity and solidarity. Uh, And and progressives are more concerned with being well progressive, right? Advancing, right? Looking to the future, leaving the past behind. Um, And so that includes, you know, like doing something that you're you know, parents thought wasn't cool, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe traveling to another country, adopting new norms, right? So we've known about those kind of differences as long as there's been a definition for progressive versus conservative, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so in some sense, that's definitional, right? The the most basic differences between liberals and conservatives are are definitional. Um, But then the new things about the theory, right, that there's these set of taste buds and that they differ and that they're deep in the mind and maybe the brain, right, Uh, and that liberals don't have some of these and conservatives do, I don't think any of that is really empirically supported. Um, Mm. It's kind of like how John pitches it. He looks at a very kind of narrow angle and then it seems true. But if you open the whole picture of it, then it no longer is true. So So let me give you example right can we yeah can we pause real quick because i i remember you discussing this and i wanted to ask you about that like so the way and maybe i'm perceiving it wrong and like i i don't know like so so what I, what I, my understanding of the moral foundations theory was not that, you know, liberals don't have certain moral foundations, but kind of like uh, tuning like uh, a knob, right? And just certain things are turned down 
more. So is it that, you know, liberals, like uh, John's arguing that liberals don't have certain ones or they're just like dampened, like, okay, I care about loyalty and tradition, but not nearly as much as these people who refuse to take down, uh, you know, um, a flag that, you know, depicts, you know, the, a time in history when we had, you know, people as slaves, you know what I mean? So is it dampened or is it just not, he argues that it's not there for some people. I mean, I think he argues both, right? So I think what what folks like John sometimes do is they take the strongest case at first, and then mm. they kind of back up to the place where it's no longer kind of interesting in some sense, right? Mm. Okay. So sometimes he says, look, there are these really powerful, and John and I have gone back and forth in, in the kind of scientific literature, right? Yeah. So the first formulation is like, look, there are these five things, conservatives have them, liberals don't. And they're like these switches in the, in the brain, um, which is what he, he says in his book, right? There's like switches in the brain and, and those are modules and conservatives have five, liberals have two, right? There's a conservative advantage. Mm -hmm. Recently, he just says, look, these are just kind of metaphors, right? For how people see the world mm -hmm. and, and, and something like that, um, you can't, is not scientific anymore because you can't disprove it, right? But yeah. let's let's take purity. Let's take purity, right? It's something that like conservatives have in liberal stone, right? We've mm -hmm. known for a long time that conservatives are less down uh, with premarital sex, mm -hmm. right? With polyamory, right? With like not being religious. But yeah. but again, that's not new, right? Like 50 years ago, if you're like, who's more down with um, you know fetishes and orgies? It's definitely <laughs> yeah, right. Like we we don't need a theory of taste buds to tell us that. But now let's let's take John's idea that like there's this taste bud of purity and, and liberals don't really have it. Well, can you tell me why uh, liberals do juice cleanses? Why liberals do yoga? Ooh, why liberals okay. Fasts, right? Where liberals, you know, try to do programs to to get clean from drug addiction, right? Uh. Why it's so important to like be a vegetarian and watch what you eat. And even like, right, anti-vaxxers are often uh, liberals too. So I, I think you can take cases that fit John's idea. You can take cases that don't fit John's idea. So right? it's kind and, of the, 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 what is it? The sharpshooter fallacy where you kind of move the target wherever you, wherever you want kind of thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. And in fact, you know, the loyalty thing, sure, if you're talking about loyalty to a preacher, conservatives are more loyal. But you want to talk about loyalty to a civil rights leader, right? Like if Obama tells you to do something and you're a progressive, right? Like mm -hmm. if someone betrays Obama, you'd be like, that's bullshit, right? Like yeah. you need to listen to Obama. So there's been work that shows that there's no differences between liberals and conservatives in all sorts of these things. Okay. If you just look at more examples, right? Got it. Okay. Dope. So, okay. Sorry for interrupting that. I needed some clarity on that. So what is this kind of alternative? Cause I remember you talking about, yeah, it like it's, it's not so much scientific and I'm a huge nerd when it comes to the scientific pro uh, process, falsifiability, all that kind of stuff. So what's an alternative way or explanation or what's, what's your thing when we look at how we kind of view our morality? Right. So the, I mean, first up, the alternative is just knowing what we've always known about liberals and conservatives, right? Conservatives and progressives, right? That, that there are differences when it comes to tradition and patriotism, right? That the mostly conservatives who are, you know, Marines and mostly liberals who are, I don't know, social workers, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think you should discard everything we already knew about liberals and progressives, or sorry, progressives and conservatives, but I think you, you don't have to think that there's these like taste buds in the mind or whatever, right? So Mm -hmm. Take the things that we already knew, um, because those are true. But I think to make sense uh, of the moral world, we've already been talking about how to do it, right? You, you need to understand these kind of perceptions of harm, right? Like, who mm -hmm. is the villain? Who is the victim? Uh, and once you have a sense of those assumptions, then you can really make sense of a lot of the moral world, right? So. Mm -hmm. Right. So John's been a, a, been a kind of proponent against outrage culture, right? Because mm -hmm. I think he sees himself uh, and similar folks as, as being victimized, right? You know, mm -hmm. he just wants to say something. Uh, he, he wants to say it assertively. 
uh, on social media and people say, well, you're causing harm now. He says, well, well, I'm the victim, right? And so this thing is bad. But other people yeah. on the other side saying, well, like, no, you're the villain, I'm the victim, right? So everyone has this kind of same template, right? We see the world as villains and victims mm -hmm. and it's just kind of like where you see those. And, and yeah. part of that comes from your culture, right? Which John's emphasized and I think is right from your upbringing, from your social world, from your followers on Twitter, right? All those things. Mm -hmm. uh, but it ultimately so, comes down to how you kind of construct the world of harm and vulnerability. So I, I guess one question I have for you, would you would you say that rather than like these kind of set moral taste buds, like based on everything we've even talked about and kind of how, you know, there's that fine line between hero and villain and, you know, perceptions and, you know, all these other things, would you say it's, it's more rather than like set in stone kind of like moral taste buds it's more like contextual like what's going on in that situation and you know because like i said i got really into like group psychology and my morals might be different me sitting here talking to you or if i'm in a crowd of people doing something else so i i'm not sure if that's what you're saying yeah that's what i'm saying so let's take a step back and think about like how many values there are mm. moral values in, in, in the lives of humans. Yeah. yeah. So Hyde talks about five, but we could probably think about a hundred of them, right? Oh yeah. Like, I don't know, benevolence, um, the, yeah, in this, you know, how, whether people are industrious, whether people, um, uh, the one example I really like is like punctual. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, just uh, when I was, uh, you know, after all this happened, I was talking with my therapist. One of the exercises she had me do was she gave me a value list, values list. I think there was like pff, two or 300 on there. <laughs> like right. there was just like this kind of endless amount. So, yeah, absolutely. That list can go on forever, depending on who you are and what you find important. So, yeah. So let's consider punctuality, right? Like is, is punctuality wrong or, 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 you know, important value? Well, you could argue like, well, maybe conservatives are, are more, you know, orderly. And so they should have more punctu be more into punctuality. It's like, well, maybe in like Northern Europe, they're in, in, into punctuality. So they have a taste bud, whereas like Southern Europe, they might not. And you could construct all these stories. But, but then you think, well, well, really, what does it mean to be punctual? And, and when does it matter? Speaking of context, well, mm. it's important to be punctual when not being punctual causes harm right? Mm. Like if I'm going to mail my kids college applications in and I'm a month late and now they don't go to college, right? Yeah. Like that seems like a shitty thing to do. <laughs> but if I show up to a party five minutes late, right? And other people do too, then, then no big deal, right? So we've got our kind of like social norms, the context, and, and ultimately whether it causes harm. And I think the best way to figure out, you know, whether something seems wrong out of the 300 values, right? Yeah. Is whether people think that th that it causes harm. And it's it seems like through your research too, like the way we view what is harmful is also contextual, right? Like, uh, like you, the the CEO punching the baby. Like, if we ask somebody, it's like, is hitting wrong? Is it morally just terrible, right? But if we add some more context, like a baby punching a CEO, like nobody, like, you know, the way we perceive that baby, we're not going to be like, oh yeah, this, this, put this kid in jail, you know? So, so the action, it, it, it really depends on the context, like who it is, when it was, all these other things. Like, for example, with my situation, I, uh, aside from, you know, a, a few of the uh, YouTubers who got like offended or their feelings hurt by what I was doing, I had other YouTubers reach out and say, thank you, Chris. Like, I didn't even understand this about myself because I would dive into like the psychology of like trauma and stuff. Like one of my most viewed videos has almost a million views and it was about a, 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 a domestic uh, and sexual abuse situation that somebody shared on YouTube. And I broke it down because, you know, there's a lot of victim blaming and all this. And I'm like, listen, here's what happens. Here's what the research says about what happens to, you know, people after a traumatic event. You know what I mean? And that creator, I actually ended up collaborating with her. She was thankful for it. So anyways, what I'm getting yeah. at is, you know, the, the context is very important. Like, you know, to one creator, they thanked me. And to the other one, they hated me. Right. So, uh -huh. so context plays a pretty big, pretty big factor in all this. Right. 
Totally right. The lens you see it through and, and the, and the culture, right? So mm. the, there's this classic example uh, in moral psychology, moral philosophy that, that really shifted the mind of the field about whether um, morality, moral judgment was based on harm. Yeah. And so it, one of Haidt's mentors, an anthropologist goes to India, interviews Brahmin Indians. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Th- this particular sect. And they say, look, it's immoral when a son eats chicken after his father's funeral. Hmm. Okay. And so to those of us in the West, we're like, wow, this is, yeah. this is kind of weird, right? Uh, this is a harmless act. You're just eating chicken, right? No big deal. Mm-hmm. But they think it's wrong. So it, it must be that morality is more than harm. We must need like additional taste buds, right? This is like height took this thing and ran with it. Mm-hmm. But look, if, if you're going to be an anthropologist, uh, you need to be an anthropologist all the way. yeah right like you need to actually figure out what it is in this society that people think about this you need context yeah and so it turns out when you talk to these brahmin indians a little more here's what they say they say a son has a job after his father passes away his son has to process the father's death pollution Okay, has to purify his soul because if he doesn't process the death pollution, the father will be stuck basically in eternal hell. And so the way the son needs to do that is to have a vegetarian diet for mm. a, you know, a period of time. So basically, if you actually ask people what's going on, right, you like do the, the full anthropological work as Schwader eventually, you know, did. Yeah. Turns out that the reason people think you shouldn't eat chicken here is because you're condemning your father's soul to hell forever, right? Eternal pain. Yeah. Well, now it looks a little more like harm to me, right? Not yeah. some like weird purity taste bud, but like a, a, a contextualized harm. And so I think that's another great example of how, look, it's about how we perceive this kind of like vulnerability and suffering in the world uh, driving our moral judgments. Yeah, yeah. And that that kind of, you know, makes me think uh, there was that recent book uh, by who was uh, Joseph uh, Heinrich, uh, the weirdest people in the world, right? And it was talking about like kind of the psychological, you know, it blends psychology and anthropology, and just different cultures and how we view it. And I'm currently reading this other book called, I believe it's called Out of Our Minds. And it's how they view mental illness around the world, too. And, you know, and that's, these are, it's just one of the reasons I'm such a, you know, book nerd I love reading is because there's so many things that you know I think it's important to learn about and take into consideration so when I'm kind of viewing the world and all these other things because we don't even know what we don't know like you're mentioning with the chicken thing like if you just told a random person like if you came down to Vegas went down to the strip and told a hundred people like what any like how many of them would know like the full context of that um but I, I wanted to ask you this and I don't want to keep it too much longer like I Kurt we could we could we can have our own vacation and talk all, all day. But <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you this because, uh, yeah, we keep talking about harm and perception of harm. And something else um, that I remember you kind, kind of disagreeing with uh, was this idea of moral dumbfounding. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Haidt's idea of moral dumbfounding is there's certain situations that you could present to a person. There's a famous one about, you know, brother and sister sleeping together, but, you know, nobody can get pregnant. Nobody's going to find out all these other things. Right. And no harm is done. But when you ask people that can't really explain why this is bad, like they can't come up with a reason for it. And he calls that moral dumbfounding. And was that something that, you know, you, you disagreed with? If so, why? Because that also kind of clicked for me because it felt like when I was questioning people, when I would actually have conversations about my situation, people were like, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just wrong. It's just what you're doing is wrong, Chris. And, you know, I'd say, well, why was it not wrong last week? And now it's wrong today, you know, and they, I, I don't know. So moral dumbfounding intuitively just made sense to me. So what are your, what are your thoughts around that or alternative theories? Yeah, I think moral dumbfounding is like, in some sense, Haidt's biggest coup in the field, right? Because there's, he never published the paper, mm. right? He just like talked to some undergrads, came up with his own intuitions about what was going on, and then coined a phrase that's kind of taken things over. Mm. So again, let, let's drill down, right? Just like questions of purity kind of fall apart once you broaden the, the understanding of purity to not only include God, but also like juice cleanses and yoga. So to, I think, does moral dumbfounding kind of fall apart, right? So what he does is he's like, here's this example of incest, right? A a brother and a sister 
they're having sex with each other, but it's great and no one gets pregnant, right? It's like mm-hmm. the greatest thing. Yeah. Well, first up, you got to believe that that's true, right? Mm. And like 99.99% of the time that there is incest, chances are it's not like a brother and a sister <laughs> are like having a lot of fun and rediscovering themselves, you know? Yeah. Like chances are it's some bad shit, right? So th- I think the the key point here is that no one believes this, right? Mm, okay. Like if you ask people like, <clears throat> is it harmless? Cause Heights like, look, I designed it to be harmless. If you ask people like, do you think this is harmless? And they're like, uh, no. Cause I just don't think that's true, right? So, so, so uh, just so I can understand what you're saying. So do you think that the results would be different if you had more realistic situations, because there's like, there's, there's like another one. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and for anybody who's just being introduced to moral philosophy, like, I, I feel like it, it just like shocks them. But anyways, there's another example about like having like buying a chicken, having sex with it, then killing it and eating it or something like that, right? Like, there's just these weird, weird things. So like, but like, are you saying like, one of the reasons we don't get accurate data is because nobody sees these as realistic or something that we could even like put like uh, into like a real situation. Like, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, it's because, you know, I've been emphasizing all along that harm is a matter of perception. And mm-hmm. if you're, you know, Hyde claims to be kind of an anthropologist. And if you're an anthropologist, you have to actually ask people what they think, right? Mm-hmm. You, can't, you can't just assume that like, you know, I designed this to be harmless, so they must think it's harmless. Well, turns out no one thinks it's harmless, right? Oh, so, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, they're like, hey, I bet there's still some lasting psychological damage for having sex with your sibling. Mm. And it's like impossible. Like, really? Is it so hard to believe that people just can't be convinced, right? Like, let's say, let's say I describe an example, like here's someone who's addicted to, you know, to, to opiates and meth at the same time. Uh, mm-hmm. They take a ton of it. But guess what? It's really great for them. Their family loves it. It, it helps them have a great career. And, and, and everyone thinks it's the greatest thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Like, I, I feel like it's maybe hard to believe, right? Or like someone says cruel things to their spouse, but they actually think it's really funny, right? <laughs> uh, and that's yeah. part of what gets them going, right? So I, I think all these things, you kind of have this gut feeling that it's yeah. not, not really harmless. And so what is happening in these scenarios isn't that there's an objectively harmless thing that people think is still wrong and then we need to figure out, well, why do they still think it's harmful? What's actually happening is that people still perceive it as harmful and that's it, right? Yeah. Like someone lives next door to you and they're fucking a chicken. Well, yeah. do you want your daughter to hang out? <laughs> well, they're outside the yeah. yard. like i don't i've got two daughters you know yeah like, i don't want the chicken fucker to be like oh hey how are your kids doing yeah like, and, and and it's kind of like uh not to, to just say well no in this particular situation this guy would never hurt uh, a, a child right like what what i think about when when you're discussing this too is uh, just even like PTSD, right? Like, uh, look at, you know, look at 9-11 or other traumatic events, like how many car crashes happen on a daily basis or, you know, annual basis. Some people are traumatized by it. Others aren't, right? And the science is, you know, still out. Like we don't, we don't know the exact factors, right? We don't know who will become traumatized by this. So, I, I guess like, you know, are, are you kind of saying like when we when we hear examples like this, you know, are just even perceiving the future, like there's so many unknowns that it's like, maybe it's safer to not do it because of because of the potential harm, like because it's likely just based on what we know about humans and stuff like that, like, just don't just don't do that, you know? Yeah, right. So so one hand where we're probabilistic, right? So if you get wasted and drive home drunk mm. and you you end up at home totally safe. Is mm-hmm. that a harmless act? I mean, exactly. One thing, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but right. And so this is basically what the incest thing is. Although Heights like, no, no, hundred percent. Like everything's cool. Uh, on the other hand, right. Like we're hardwired to, to be afraid of a lot of things. So, you know, there's yeah. this, like this platform that goes out over the Grand Canyon. It's like, yep. it's, it's glass and you can look down. Yep. So it's objectively safe, right? You can put like a jumbo jet on it, it wouldn't fall. So let's say yeah. you're out there, 
you're standing over a canyon, there's nothing. You're just looking straight down, thousands of feet below, you see the river, like the winds whistling and you're sweating. Mm -hmm. And I say, like, well, why are you sweating? You're like, well, I'm afraid. And I say, why are you afraid? And you say, well, because I'm thousands of feet above a canyon and it's <laughs> Yeah, I right? and I'm bottom. like, whoa, 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 but it's objectively safe. And, yeah. And you're like, yeah, but I just don't believe it because, you know, we evolved to be afraid of this. And I say, well, no, you know, it's objectively safe. So you're like, you're afraid dumbfounded because yeah. like I tell you, you're not allowed to say that you're afraid because it's high because you know it's safe. So there must be some other reason. Let's find it. I'm like, you're not dumbfounded for shit. You, yeah. You're telling the reason why you're afraid because it's high. You just don't believe that it's objectively safe, right? Yeah. So dumbfounding is a myth. Uh, it, mm. It's just because Height didn't ask the person that he was studying if they actually thought it was harmless. Yeah, it, it's 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 really great. This is another reason I'm so glad we got to talk because I, I remember hearing your other interview and I'm like, I have like a hundred questions and and now it's it's making a lot a lot more sense. I, I totally get get what you mean by this. And and yeah, it's it's interesting too, just because I am so into evolutionary psychology. Like there's there's reasons, there's reasons why we have that that reaction to sleeping with a relative, right? Or when you're talking yeah. of when you're talking about uh, you know, standing above the grand canyon later this week i'm uh talking with randolph uh messy and uh he wrote a book on like evolutionary reasons for you know anxiety and depression and all this and he would have mm -hmm. he would have very in-depth reasons for why this is happening and and all that so it also kind of depends on what your personal knowledge is about how we evolve why this is happening and all this because there is a uh a, a, a rational reason because i guess dumbfounding kind of implies that it's irrational right but there is right a rational reason for it but i i man i i want i want to wrap this up a little bit because i i i, I feel terrible because i want to talk to you forever but one of my last questions for you kurt okay i have two questions but this one first they're very short i promise so one of my last questions uh in your in your life right like you you have a wife you got kids i'm sure you have friends who are non-academics don't work in moral philosophy with the thought experiments and stuff that you have that you do, do people think that you are like a closet psychopath for like the thought experiments that you have to come up with for the research that you do? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, something I've always wondered. <laughs> I mean, I think they think that that um, I don't know if they judge me as being a psychopath as much as thinking that uh, maybe my mind works a little differently. <laughs> I'd like to be charitable about those attributions with, with my friends that they think that's an endearing quirk and not evidence of psychopathy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's interesting. The, the longer I've stayed sober and more I like start to get to know and talk to people. Like, like, I think one of the reasons I enjoy moral philosophy, because just like, uh, you know, I, I get crazy thoughts and I have conversations with friends about crazy thoughts. And just even the other day, I won't even dive into the example, but we were talking about uh, something with uh, the block blockchain technology and how they're making video games about around it. And he came up with something that it, it feels like one of you guys would come up with in a moral <laughs> you know, research lab uh -huh. for moral philosophy. I was like, you are twisted. But, uh, but yeah, I've been curious about that. So, okay, final question, I promise. So when I finished the mind club, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm actually currently on my second read, I have like one or two chapters. And I know, uh, and I want people to go get it. Like, uh, it's, it's really interesting. Um, just how it was written, how it came about and all that. But when I finish the book, and even after this conversation, the thought that keeps running through my head is this, Kurt, when the hell are you going to take a break and write me and the rest of the world another book about this stuff? Because they're <laughs> just all the stuff we talked about today, like some of it's in the mind club, but I feel like, I feel like you have a whole nother book in you. Yeah. So are there any plans? I'm feeling, uh, <laughs> I've got a proposal. I've got a proposal all but written. So. Uh, got, okay. Well, well, if there's anything I can do, you, you message me, I will go petition for you or whatever. Cause I like, as soon as I finish, I'm like, okay, I need, I need. I need more. And I'm not a huge fan of like academic papers. I like books because they, they have fun little stories and stuff like that. So, so get that, get that proposal done for me, Kurt. That's the one favor I need from you. 
I will. You can be you can be a a, a hype man. And I would definitely appreciate some uh, uh, some hype when it comes out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in in my world, in the mental health or addiction recovery, we have accountability buddies. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be bugging you. I'm gonna set a reminder once a week. But um, but, <laughs> but yeah, but. But the good thing is, the good thing is people have plenty of time to go uh, grab a copy of the Mind Club and get into that. But yeah, for everybody who uh, wants to keep up to date with you, potential updates about an upcoming future book and the research you're doing, the work that you're doing, and you do a couple other projects, like you were doing some live streams, like where can people find you so they can stay up to date with all this kind of stuff? So yeah, I'm on Twitter. Um... I, uh, and I have a couple websites, uh, like the deepest beliefs lab has a lot, mm -hmm. a lot of my stuff. Uh, that's a little more kind of academic and the center for the science of moral understanding. And then we're going to start a newsletter soon about uh, ways to bridge divides and that's tied to the center. So that might be, um, that might be interesting when it comes out, stay tuned. Got it. Okay. That's awesome. I'm, I'm writing that down because yeah, that's something I'm definitely interested in. Cause I have a lot of people on here when we're talking about polarization and, you know, even just my experience, I'm always curious about this. So I would love that newsletter. So yeah, Kurt, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and yeah, I'll, I'll be messaging you soon for some accountability on that new book. Awesome. All right, everybody. No, seriously, seriously. How great was that conversation wasn't that wasn't that great like i i i learned so much from kurt and i just had like it was it was raining down epiphanies on me i'm like oh my god there is so much clarity happening and i'm glad i, I was able to pick his brain about some of the stuff uh where he you know disagrees with jonathan Haidt and all that that's that's all kind of interesting to me but yeah i hope for all of you who you know uh follow what's going on and you're curious about you know cancel culture and all all the craziness uh i think a lot of it like comes down to how we view morality and how it's shifting and changing and and yeah like uh, i i think you know we we got some answers and it helps me it helps me kind of deal with it and be a little bit more empathetic and be like all right okay i i get it it's part of human nature i don't like it but it sucks, all right? <laughs> but, but, uh, but it, you know, it's good to know. And I, I hope you guys enjoyed that. But please, please, please go show Kurt some love. Uh, follow him. Uh, his Twitter is down in the description as well as his websites. And there was a link to the Mind Club. But yeah, um, while you're down there, make sure you're following me too at The Rewired Soul on Instagram and Twitter. And if you're new, if you enjoyed this episode, please follow it. Please subscribe uh, on Spotify or Apple, wherever you are. But if you're on Apple, leave a rating, leave a review, leave a little comment, if you will. And hey, if you want people to learn about the moral philosophy of cancel culture or any of the other cool stuff and books that we talk about here, make sure you share it. All that stuff helps kind of grow our little beautiful community and reach more people. And yeah, I just, I really dig having conversations about interesting topics. So yeah, let's, let's get more people on board. So go share this episode. All right. But yeah, for all of you, uh, who want to support the podcast in any way, there's more links down in the description below. Uh, there are my books that I've uh, pu self-published. One of them is called Cancelled Inside YouTube Cancel Culture. So if you want to go in, if you want to go in deep, if you want to know all the details, like I did this as uh, a form of like kind of self-therapy after it all happened. Uh, so yeah, that, that book's available on my website, therewiredsoul.com, as well as some other mental health books that I've written. Uh, or you could become a patient Patreon, or there is a link down below for better help online therapy. I mentioned, I mentioned in here that one of the things that saved my butt when I got canceled was therapy and I was using better help online therapy. I had a licensed therapist. She was awesome. And that is why I will vouch for them until the day I die. All right. So if you are looking for help with your mental health, you want to work with a licensed therapist from the comfort of your own home and it's affordable, check out that affiliate link for better help online therapy. All right. But yeah, this was definitely one of the longer episodes. So if you're still here, still listening, I appreciate you. Go show Kurt some love, grab a copy of his book. And yeah, we got some other great episodes coming out this week. We're going to get a little spooky this week too for all you spooky fans. So make sure that you stay tuned and you're following me so you don't miss an episode, all right? But have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you next time.